Thank you very much for having come here. I know that it is an extremely difficult day for all of you with uh, all the developments and everything, all the news that you need to cover. But in, in a way, uh, everything that is happening now is related uh, to the subject of our conference. And um, it is actually the outcomes, the results, the findings of our conference that we want to announce to you today. It was a conference that took place in Arachova during the weekend. It was organized by a group of uh, European and scholars, you have a list of the participants, you know who have participated in this uh, Congress. Uh, I would not like to mention any names because I might omit someone and uh, make exceptions, so I don't like that. Uh, every uh, participant has been very important and significant and they have all contributed uh, to our Congress. The topic, the subject of the conference was the European crisis and of course the Greek crisis as well as uh, the most acute manifestation of the European crisis. Second topic uh, has been the alternatives uh, to uh, against the neoliberalism and uh, the Maastricht treaty system because we have seen the results of its functioning these last years uh, throughout uh, Europe and particularly in Greece. And uh, there has been a strong criticism against this system, which uh, I call, but anyway, I think uh, it is the most uh, legitimate term, uh, the system of neoliberalism, uh, which is captured legally in the Maastricht Treaty and the following European treaties, uh, which uh, supplemented the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, but uh, we do not have equally powerful alternatives formulated. The alternative vision uh, against uh, the European, the, the today's European construct, which actually is a monster, a monstrous uh, construct, and uh, it is not serving the goals of prosperity, democracy, or peace. Uh, because uh, it, those were actually the principles on, uh, on the basis of which the European plan uh, was promoted uh, to the European peoples. So instead of having convergence among economies and societies of the European periphery, we actually have a divergence. And uh, this divergence is tragic in the case of Greece. Uh, because uh, there is an up, uh, there is a disaster which uh, uh, the last uh, three or five years goes beyond the economic losses of France or Germany during the First World War. And uh, indeed, in the context of a program which is considered to be uh, a rescue program or a bailout program which was supposed uh, to help Greece. At the same time, uh, there is an uh, uh, inertia, and it is uh, true that all parties of the radical uh, left in Europe have not uh, claimed a clear uh, um, uh, solutions on what has to be done in Europe. Uh, should everybody stay in the European Union? Should everybody exit the European Union? Uh, what uh, uh, would the transitional uh, claim uh, be? And could that uh, be uh, claimed on the level of uh, several countries, supranational or uh, supra-regional level? Or should the countries which feel that they cannot exist anymore in this uh, suffocating system um, uh, pursue their exit? And is this exit that simple because uh, uh, because uh, for example it's not clear for the participants uh, of the conference uh, uh, whether the nation state needs to be defended because uh, the market forces are trying to destroy uh, the functions of uh, uh, national and social protection, which uh, uh, used to be with uh, the European, uh, with, uh, with the nation state. On the other hand, Europe seems uh, to be inadequate to protect the countries under the pressures, uh, the pressure of the markets. So what should we do? And there has also been criticism uh, 
focusing on austerity. And it is a correct criticism. Some people suggest the return uh, to a Keynesian uh, um, a demand policy. But could, uh, could the Keynesianism of any kind be uh, uh, implemented in an environment where there is a full liberation of the markets and full uh, deregulation of uh, capital transfer? If we give demand in such a society, this demand will uh, end up out of Europe if it is not accompanied by some type of protectionism. Could any type of economic policy be um, applied um, when uh, the financial sector has gone uh, beyond any control and is laughing at us? It is laughing with politicians and governments of the European Union. And actually, it has uh, even uh, uh, appropriated the, 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 the money issuance um, function. So during the, these uh, last four months of the negotiations uh, between Athens and the creditors or institutions or the Troika, uh, no matter how we call them, we had the chance uh, to find out that Mr. Draghi, a veteran of Goldman Sachs, um, an uncontrollable head of uh, the European Central Bank, is actually the real prime minister of Europe. And uh, he has a very strong power, uh, more power than any other prime minister, because he can threaten. He can threaten in a way that uh, no other prime minister would do in a country. He is threatening Greece with uh, bankruptcy, with default, uh, to oblige the country follow the policy he desires. So it's a whole series of uh, questions. Uh, what the alternative could be in Europe? That was a topic we discussed the second topic we discussed. And the third uh, topic uh, was uh, the deterioration, the worsening of the situation in Ukraine. And uh, the risk the risk of uh, much uh, larger uh, military conf conflict and even the real hazard for the first time after the Cuba missile uh, crisis, uh, the hazard of a conflict uh, between uh, the US and Russia. M many people might uh, think that uh, we are exaggerating in terms of uh, the risks, the dangers, but uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, have uh, uh, we we did have uh, Paul uh, Craig Roberts uh, from the U.S. who uh, has sent us his uh, speech. Of course, he cannot be considered as extremist or communist or uh, a strange person. He, he is well aware of uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, military and political system, and he does believe in this risk. And, uh, we ha and Stephen Cohen uh, has uh, also said that the current situation is even more dangerous than the Cold War, because there are no rules in this game. And in the center of the Western system, there is an extremist uh, group of uh, neoconservatives, which is uh, more powerful than Obama and Merkel and Hollande. And this uh, group uh, uh, pursues conflict and uh, destruction of Russia for well-known reasons uh, that they have announced themselves with uh, the famous slogan, the famous motto for an American uh, new century, 21st century. And uh, the last time we had uh, a political, su such a political decision was uh, 2003, uh, Chirac and Schroeder uh, times, uh, where they were a no, when a no was voiced uh, against uh, the attack against Iraq. Uh, since uh, then, uh, um, uh, Europe has been surrendering uh, to the stock market capital, geopolitical uh, issues, and so on. Is uh, is always subdued under uh, the U.S. It, and uh, this had never happened before, had never happened during the Cold War. 
not even during the worst moments of the Cold War. There are two documents uh, which are being prepared. Uh, they are not ready yet, but uh, if uh, you give us your email addresses, of course, we will get them from the Athens news agencies. We are preparing two documents so on the Greek crisis, expressing our solidarity to the Greek people and inviting the European peoples to realize that what happens in Greece and the unacceptable loan agreements, which uh, violate, obviously, the Greek and European uh, legality and uh, the principles on which uh, the European Union was established and uh, truly suffocate, uh, strangle a whole country and are the precursor for uh, the disassembling of uh, the nation state, which has been one of the major achievements uh, of uh, the whole world and also uh, the uh, dissolution of democracy. So it's not just a matter of solidarity to Greeks. It's a matter of vital importance for all uh, peoples, even the German people, because even if uh, because if the Germans continue obeying blindly their political elite, I'm afraid we'll end up with the same results uh, that we've had in the past. Nobody will uh, gain from such uh, wars of debt in uh, Europe, and. Um, Nobody will gain from an effort uh, to subordinate uh, uh, and defeat a small European people. And uh, the second document will be on uh, the uh, war or peace uh, subject, uh, which is a vital uh, topic in Europe as well. I also uh, need uh, to state that this conference uh, was uh, supported by the Foundation for Governance and uh, Growth. Uh, which uh, is uh, chaired by Gerasimos Arsenis, the former minister, supported also by Lysaitis Foundation in Cyprus. It was also supported by the Third World uh, Forum, the Forum of uh, uh, Alternatives for the Third War, chaired by the well-known economist uh, and uh, fighter for social rights. And uh, he also happened to be a close friend of Andreas Papandreou, Samir Amin. We have the pleasure to have him with us uh, today. It was also supported by the Institute for uh, Globalization and uh, Geopolitical Movements, uh, uh, chaired by Mr. Kagariski from Russia. He's also with us uh, today. And uh, also the Sofia Club. Uh, chaired by a well-known journalist and politician and writer, Giulietto Chiesa, uh, who used to be a correspondent uh, of uh, the UNITA uh, Communist Political Party, uh, Italian uh, political party in uh, Moscow. Uh, we have a few participants to the conference here today. Those who could uh, be uh, here are attending this uh, press conference. So they are at your disposal if you wish uh, to raise any questions. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Zenar, who is um, a writer, one of the best analysts of the European phenomenon. And uh, if I'm not wrong, he has also, he's an expert on, um, on uh, the World Trade Organization and European law subjects. Uh, uh, Professor Arfater is also here with us, an economist, one of the most important economists in Germany. We also have uh, with us Professor Hudson from the US, uh, who has written uh, some of uh, the smartest analysis on uh, the debt bubble issue. Mr. Koenig from uh, Switzerland former executive of uh, ITT, if I'm not wrong, if I remember correctly, and uh, one of the most radical uh, geopolitical, he is today one of the most radical geopolitical and economic an analysts uh, throughout the world. We have the gentleman uh, here who is both a participant to the conference and a journalist uh, at the same time. He is a great journalist. Constantine, I cannot see your earphones. 
για σένα μιλάω Κωνσταντίν, αν θέλεις να ακούσεις τι λέω για σένα, να βάλεις τα ακουστικά σου. So he is a journalist and participant to the conference at the same time. He is from the state Russian TV, one of the most famous uh, uh, presenters uh, of uh, programs, uh, TV programs in Russia. We also have Mr. Pantelitis, who uh, uh, has uh, conveyed uh, to us, has described the situation with uh, the memorandum in Cyprus and the situation in Cyprus uh, because uh, things are not uh, going well there either. And uh, Tatiana Stanoska, of course, our very good friend, a uh, member of the European Parliament from Latvia. Uh, there was a number of countries represented at the, con- at the conference, Bulgaria, Cyprus, uh, Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, France, Latvia, and the Russian Federation. And we also had representatives uh, from the US. Yanis Mavros, I think, is with us as well. Yes, yes, Yanis Mavros is here. He also participated. He's a member of the National uh, Board uh, for uh, the German War Reparations, right? Anyway, uh, all uh, claims we have from Germany from the Second World War. Uh, I think uh, if uh, it, it would be better to give you the floor so that you can ask any questions to the participants. But before I close, ah, we also have here Dimitris Patelis, uh, uh, alternate professor of philosophy in uh, uh, the Crete uh, Technical University. Uh, he made a very interesting speech on the character of the Ukrainian crisis. I think I have not omitted anyone, but if uh, I have, please forgive me. Anyway, uh, that was not just a conference uh, for holding a conference. Uh, we, it was a meaningful work, and we hope that this work uh, will be continued. There is going to be a coordinating committee which uh, will assume uh, uh, the work from now on uh, to uh, two directions. On one hand, uh, uh, the committee will try to continue this uh, debate on Europe because, of course, it could not be completed in one weekend, but it will also uh, pursue uh, other contributions from other countries in order to find out uh, how we can seek an alternative. The second direction will be uh, cooperation with all forces in uh, Europe uh, in view of the war in Ukraine in order to immediately uh, lift the sanctions and lift uh, this uh, Cold War climate because uh, if uh, the most radical and extremist uh, side of uh, the international status quo manages uh, to push things uh, towards a more extreme conflict, things will get more difficult in Donetsk, Lukansk, or even Moldavia. Uh, I'm at your disposal and our friends as well, if you want to ask any questions. Well, it's a real challenge. Whom are we supposed uh, to ask? Because I don't want uh, to make distinctions. Nina Melisova is my name, political editor in uh, the Athens News Agency. For our uh, foreign uh, guests, let me say that this is uh, the national uh, news agency. Well, I will first ask our German uh, guest, uh, Mr. Fater, Alfater. Mr. Alfater and Mr. Hudson, the U.S. guest, uh, the guest from the U.S., if I am pronouncing the names correctly, says the speaker. I would like them to tell us their opinion. What uh, do we expect uh, from today's critical meetings that will be held between the Greek Prime Minister and our European partners? And if you allow me, uh, I will Uh, put one further question without, of course, wanting to abuse your time. Anyway, how how do you see the latest proposals 
submitted by the Greek government uh, on uh, the negotiations table. If you want, you can come here, otherwise you can answer from there. On the way up to this conference, we noticed from the teletype downstairs that the stock markets were soaring on uh, the expectation that an agreement would be reached today. Uh, I think there was a mistranslation. By agreement, they meant surrender. Uh, the terms, as I understand it, is that uh, uh, the only agreement that uh, the Europeans would accept would be for uh, the party to reject its political, the Syriza party and coalition, to reject its political program uh, that it was elected to do, and to adopt the PESOC and conservative program of uh, cutting back pensions and continuing to privatize uh, industry. <laughs> and uh, the negotiators, I'm told, have said that this is a uh, red line that they have said from the very beginning. And so the, uh, the Europeans uh, have uh, responded by saying, uh, you, we, you must give up your red line. You must uh, act as if you were not elected. You must act as if the people had elected the party that they just threw out of power. And if you don't but do that, we will declare you in arrears to the International Monetary Fund against all of the uh, International Monetary Fund's own rules and despite the fact that the International Monetary Fund economists for the European section, as early as 2011, all said there was no way uh, that uh, Greece could possibly pay the debt, uh, that they urged that the debt be written down. Uh, and when Dominique Strauss-Kahn said, I can't say this because I want to run for the presidency of France, and the European Central Bank has said that uh, we cannot, we the IMF cannot be part of the solution unless we uh, agree to everything the European Central Bank did. The IMF economists resigned, uh, went public, uh, have published uh, their reviews of the meetings in anger. Uh, and so I agree with the IMF economists that have left. The debt is unpayable. There is no money to be paid. And the basic principle in all uh, the question that you ask is a debt that can't be paid won't be. Thank you, Professor Hanson. Uh, Mr. Alfater, would you like? You can use this. It is not possible to know everything what has been uh, said and written in the newspapers today. Uh, because we come from Delphi and there was no access uh, to new and, uh, and uh, uh, the actual information. But nevertheless, uh, the situation is nearly the same as it was before. Uh, that is a question of uh, the debt on the one hand and of uh, the credits on the other hand. Or that is the question of the contradiction between monetary wealth owners, private ones, as well as uh, official uh, ones on the one hand, and the debtors who have to pay debt service on the other hand. So when the debtors cannot pay debt service, then they are in a bad position. Uh, they are so long in a bad position as they uh, can be forced to pay debt service on the debts they have. And the question is, is Greece in a state that it can pay debt service out of the debts in the next future, or is that not possible? And the role of the creditors at the moment, uh, supported uh, by the uh, Troika, formerly called Troika, or now called uh, the institutions, is that uh, they uh, hold the power of blackmailing not only the Greek government, but also the Greek uh, people, the population, the institutions, the, the constitutional institutions uh, in Greece. And this uh, power to exert, to blackmail uh, Greece, uh, that is a very comfortable position in Europe because that means uh, that in Greece the uh, attempt to establish uh, some alternatives of a Europe with a social face, as it has been called earlier, uh, formerly, 
uh, a peaceful Europe, an economically also efficient uh, Europe in the terms of the real economy and not only in the terms of the financial economy. And then a Europe which should also be an ecological, envir environmentally friendly Europe. These alternatives are uh, the in danger uh, through, by means of uh, the uh, creditors who exert this power, blackmailing uh, uh, an alternative government in Greece, and in so far also, uh, 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 also strengthening uh, the conservative powers in other uh, European uh, countries. And therefore, what is happening in Greece has not only to do, or has not only consequences in Greece, but also in other countries. Uh, of other European countries, because it is uh, the attempt to realize uh, the China, there is no alternative uh, position in uh, the European uh, politics. Greece was the first country, and perhaps the only one up to now, uh, which uh, tried to establish uh, some alternatives, because there is no future in the old neoliberal uh, policies uh, all over Europe, not only in Greece, and that is what the conservative political class in Europe tries uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, renounce, tries uh, to uh, impede. That is uh, the political question around uh, the uh, so-called Greek, but it's a Euro-Greek uh, debt crisis. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Alfater, he is Professor Emeritus in Freie Universität Berlin, in the Free University of Berlin. Uh, please, other questions? Nico Servetas from Epochi newspaper. My question is mainly addressed to participants to the conference from the Russian Federation. The gas pipe, the gas pipe which uh, has been uh, concerning the Greek economic and political life for m quite uh, several years, is uh, close uh, to construction. Is this uh, going to affect uh, the Greek economy and the independence of the country per se? Uh, well, I don't know if there is any participant who would like to reply to this question. Well, while I think that uh, the foreigners should raise the question, Mr. Kagaliski is uh, the president of the Globalization and Social Movements Institute in Moscow. Well, I think, first of all, uh, that uh, the, this whole thing with, with ga gas pipelines is of um, um, great importance and mainly for Russia, and to be more precise, it's not that much of an importance for Russia, it's more uh, of an importance for Gazprom, which is uh, the biggest Russian corporation, which is now facing a very serious uh, trouble. And uh, of course, uh, they in many ways blame uh, their Western uh, uh, partners for that, and partly, rightly so, but also partly uh, they have to blame themselves for a lot of miscalculations they made uh, because they expected the relations between Russia to and the West to continue without any changes and the demand for, for gas to uh, increase also without any change and the market uh, growing without any crisis for years after years after years and all their plans were based on that uh, assumption as well. They uh, totally miscalculated in the sense they did not think that uh, the problems in Ukraine were going to be that serious. And um, as a result of that, uh, they are looking for alternatives, alternative ways uh, to deliver uh, their product uh, to Western Europe. On the other hand, uh, it is very clear that for the countries of Western and uh, Southern Europe, Europe uh, there is no reason not to take this gas because uh, it's a stable source of supplies, and by the way, uh, it is uh, also becoming cheaper. Uh, so in that sense, I think that uh, now looking for an alternative route for their, uh, for their product, uh, they uh, are looking for Southern Europe and they're looking for Greece as a country which can buy and which can be supplied and which will need their supplies. So in that sense, I think uh, no matter what we uh, 
can say about Gazprom and their specific corporate interests, uh, this is a very positive thing uh, if they manage to deliver their, their product. But the question is whether they will succeed, uh, because also uh, their, um, the problem is that uh, given the fact that the w uh, their uh, situation is getting worse and worse politically, uh, I have quite, quite a few doubts about whether these projects are going to actually work, given the geopolitical and political situation and the growing crisis. Is there any uh, Russian, other Russian participant who would like to add something on this topic? No? Okay, then let me make a remark, if you allow me, on the Greek-Russian uh, relations. Uh, well, the significance uh, of Russia for Greece is well known. It has been well known for uh, a few decades. And it is interesting because politicians from all political parties, from the whole political spectrum, who tried uh, to find oxygen and uh, uh, breathe uh, from uh, European partners, even conservative people such as Konstantinos uh, uh, Karamanlis and Kostas Karamanlis and Makarios in uh, Cyprus, who were very conservative in the beginning of their career, not to speak of Andreas Papandreou, have uh, uh, turned to Russia. And as you know, even all revolutionary uh, movements uh, that have led uh, to the uh, liberation of the country and try to support uh, the Greek independence have also turned to Russia. So this goes beyond political parties and ideologies. Uh, this is a geopolitical necessity. There's a, a geopolitical need. And uh, Greece and Cyprus, of course, are extremely important for Russia, uh, on the other hand, because uh, this uh, space uh, uh, controls strategically the access of Russia uh, to the seas and the uh, uh, access uh, to the Middle East and its uh, energy. The outcome uh, of uh, the Greek crisis and whether Greece uh, will be able to maintain even a small independence and sovereignty and the main functions of an independent nation state is of uh, uh, pan-European and global importance. And I think it's the, the gas pipes it are a strategic issue, actually. It goes beyond the economic agreements. It's actually the strategy which is more important with the pipes, because if Greece is obliged uh, uh, sometime in the near future, not because it wants uh, so, but because it will be strangled. So if uh, it is obliged uh, to protect its uh, uh, vital survival uh, needs, uh, uh, actually it does not have many alternatives. I, I understand our politicians. I understand that they are even afraid of thinking of such uh, uh, possibilities. But, uh, you know, it's hard to try to survive. It's a hard survival needs uh, because we will try to survive as a nation and we will perhaps think of all different alternatives. Let me now uh, give you some news. Uh, we had uh, the pleasure uh, during our conference uh, to have a Skype uh, conference uh, with uh, uh, Sergei Klazev, the academician, who is uh, one uh, great Russian economist, and he has uh, studied the Kolpadiev uh, circles. Uh, he is also an important opinion maker in Russia, and uh, he is also one of uh, the advisors uh, to President Putin responsible for uh, Euro-Asian integration. Mr. Klazev's idea in general uh, was that uh, Greece has no future uh, in a Euro, uh, uh, European Union and Eurozone. On the contrary, with its comparative advantages as an economy, it would have a great uh, future in the Euro-Asian integration. Of course, it opens up a whole discussion that cannot be held right now, but uh, you can keep it in mind because I think this is an idea worth discussing. Our friend Giulietto Chiesa, I think, would like to add something. Former uh, member of the European Parliament, journalist and writer. Uh, the question of the gas uh, South Stream is, is extremely important, not only for Greece. It, it could be a good way to keep money 
because who, the country who has the possibility to, to host uh, the gas coming to Europe have, have money, as Ukraine had in the, in the for a long time. That is, it's important for Greece, it's uh, very important for Europe as a whole, because the Ukrainian crisis has been created artificially, artificially, exactly to impeach Europe to receive the gas from Russia. It, it, this is a, a gigantic question. And uh, how big it is, this question you can immediately understand if you watch the situation now in Macedonia. In Ma all the European press is silent on that. I don't know if uh, the Greek press is uh, speaking about that, but uh, in Macedonia is speaking. The, uh, the Greek press is speaking, but we, we are calling this uh, state former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia because they are using a term which is corresponding also uh -huh. to a part of our territory. Okay, okay, yeah, and I we would that. like to use terms that are somehow uh -huh. okay, uh, uh, neutral. <coughs> okay, we can they, use they F. Uh, former uh, Republic uh, of Yugoslavia, uh, if you want. But uh, the question is not uh, of the name, the question is that now in this uh, theorem, the Republic uh, is becoming a, a so-called colored revolution uh, in, in course. In Skopje there are big demonstrations uh, with uh, many Albanians uh, with the flag of Kosovo demonstrating inside uh, Skopje. What it is at the very beginning, we are at the very beginning of a new uh, point of war. And we have to understand very well what is happening. Why Macedonia? Or why Firom uh, is uh, under center? Because after Greece, there is even uh, exactly Macedonia. That is, uh, somebody is working very actively to impeach Greece to become the place of the transit of the gas. We are, uh, well, uh, as been said before me, uh, we discussed in Delphi about the uh, s critical situation of uh, security. We are going to war. The main question is that the, the public opinion in Greece and in Europe is absolutely not aware that we are going to war. And uh, the crisis around Greece is a crisis of all Europe. And uh, this is, I, I, I named the firm, former Yugoslavian Republic uh, of Macedonia. But uh, there is uh, the Transnistria cr crisis looming. Transnistria is an unknown republic uh, between uh, Moldavia and Ukraine. But this republic, half a million people, has been blocked in the last 10 days uh, by Ukraine. There is no way out from this republic. It's at the third point. It's the third point of crisis, crisis which can in every moment uh, begin. That means what you can understand. It is not a gas question. It is a European. It is a strategic. It is a big question about uh, Russia and Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Giulietto. Uh, Samir, you, you would like to, to come? You allow me to come back to the first question uh, with respect to the uh, uh, surrender uh, requested from Greece, uh, the surrender, not the agreement, total surrender. From the very beginning, my uh, view, and I was not alone to think that, is that there is no room for negotiation. The so-called Europeans do not want to negotiate. They want to uh, punish uh, Greece, the Greek people, of, for having badly voted. That is, having voted for a consistent program moving out of neoliberalism. This is forbidden by the European Constitution, by the practice, by NATO, by the uh, global imperialism of the tried US, Europe, Japan. Uh, it is totally forbidden. So by voting in that way, you move to illegality. You have to be punished. You could have been, in uh, some other cases, a country that 
would have been chosen to be bombed. It has happened elsewhere. Or a fascist coup organized, it has happened elsewhere. And it could happen here. So you have to be punished. Now, my feeling is that this should have been known from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Because uh, it's not something uh, which has been late decided by some bad Europeans. Uh, it was in the logic of the whole system from the beginning. Now, I am very, um, I admire the courage of the Greek people and the courage of Syriza. And I think that the fact that such a coalition of political forces could appear and could be audacious enough to propose to the Greek people uh, a consistent program of non-austerity, a consistent start of an alternative, uh, has to be saluted. But simultaneously, uh, the, pro the, the project was based on a contradiction from the start. We want that, and simultaneously, we do not think of moving out of the Eurozone or of Europe. There are many arguments which can be developed around why this choice of a contradictory program. I believe that the leaders of Syriza are clever enough to have understood from the beginning or before that there was a problem there. But perhaps uh, they, for one reason or another, tactical, thought that the Greek people have still such illusions about Euro and Europe could be changed and have another face and that there is a room for negotiation that we could not do differently. Anyway, whether for this or that reason, that there was that contradiction. So, without giving any advice, what I think should or could have been done would have been the following. Okay, when Syriza is elected, thanks to its audacious program, have immediately from zero a big success and the responsibility of government in this country, say to the European the following. Here is our program. We are going to implement it because we have been elected for that. And we are Democrats. We are not those Democrats that you like who are voted, elected on a program and do the opposite the next day. We are going to do it. Do you think, from your point of view, that it is compatible with remaining within the Eurozone and the European Union or not? And ask them the question. If they answer, it would have been mirac miraculous. Oh, yes, it is compatible. Then, yes, there is a room for negotiation. Let's open. We perhaps will not be able to uh, implement all the program uh, because we have to take into account other uh, elements, but there is a room. If you say no, then let us negotiate how to move out of the systems which restricts us and impeaches us of implementing our program and to move out correctly but take simultaneously measures, unilateral measures, as Greek government, in order to move into those negotiations with cards in its hand. Establish control of transfer of capital. If you have, if you take retortion measures instead of negotiation, we can take retortion measures against your own capital on the question of the debt, et cetera, et cetera. That is a plan B. Unfortunately, there was no plan B, seemingly. 
but it's not too late. Assuming even the worst, and I assume the worst, that tonight or tomorrow, with the Greek government will have surrendered. Then the battle should continue. And perhaps uh, the battle of re-mass mobilization with the target of what is a plan B. It's more difficult than it would have been before, but it, there is still room. I suggest the following. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. As I told you, Samir has been a close friend and advisor of Andreas Papandreou. Uh, please, uh, I, I want to give the floor to uh, Euro deputy from Latvia, uh, Tatiana Zdanoka. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah. Uh, I just speaking about Greece and, and uh, Russia. I want to point out what has happened today and wasn't mentioned yet. Uh, the uh, Council on the level of foreign affairs ministers have uh, prolongated uh, sanctions against Russia for next half a year. And it, it is, uh, uh, first of all, I underline that it was unanimously, that is Greeks foreign affairs minister voted in favor as well. Also, and here we, we see a big contradiction what Syriza members, representatives in the European Parliament are doing. Last week we had a session and a, a resolution prepared by one of more acute anti-Russian politicians, uh, Mr. Landsbergis, uh, on EU-Russia relations. Uh, I voted against this resolution, being a member of uh, European Free Alliance, a small part uh, aff affiliated with the Green Group, left-wing uh, political force, left-center uh, political force. Uh, Syriza representatives, they are in another group, they are in GUE, and GUE unanimously voted against this resolution, where just prolongation of sanctions against Russia was one of the issues. Yeah, but today it was the case. And it's very strange that this meeting was scheduled just for today. It wasn't scheduled for tomorrow or day after tomorrow, which was, was possible. Normally such meetings are taking place of, of, of the Council on Wednesdays, Thursdays. On Thursdays, there will be a summit. But just today <laughs> is the 22nd of June. And 22nd of June is the day of when Nazi attacked, Nazi Germany attacked Soviet Union. It is not occasionally. And it's very dangerous. I want to repeat what Julieta told. We are on a very, very uh, dangerous situation. And uh, maybe us, East Europeans and people from also former Soviet republics, we understand it much better than uh, here people here in the Western Europe realize. But you have to realize this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for reminding us that uh, today we have the anniversary of um, the Nazi German uh, attack against the against Russia. I was really surprised by what I just heard uh, because honestly I was not reading the newspapers these days because uh, we were at the conference. But if the Greek government has indeed agreed on these sanctions, exten extension of the sanctions against Russia, it, it means that it has surrendered its uh, more powerful negotiation weapon uh, for an uh, agreement. Uh, uh, that would be uh, inconceivable for a government which is negotiating to surrender the most powerful negotiation weapon just the eve of uh, an agreement. I don't know. I hope it is a, just a misunderstanding. Who else wants to add something? Mr. Kenning, yes, you can come. Mr. Kenning uh, from the Switzerland, uh, a very critical uh, geopolitical and economic analysis. I would like to refer to the first question and to what Tatiana just said, and I think they are related. Uh, the fact that Syriza voted today, tonight, uh, the, uh, the heads of state will come to probably a decision on, on Greece. 
And the fact that the vote was today and Syriza voted for the sanctions may be an indication for wanting a negotiation, uh, uh, an advance and a negotiation. My initial thought was that in the last minute, the IMF will come forward and make a concession, a small concession, not a big concession, but the concession will give with that will give Greece, and I say Greece, maybe another breathing space. The next uh, date of uh, payment will be probably then in October. And Greece may even get the 7.6 billion from the IMF, both of which I do not favor at all because it would be adding additional debt. And it would be also for, for Greece just another delay of making a, a major decision. But this is, it is a possibility, and I tell you why. Because the big loser, the big risk, first of all, is that if Greece defaults, which is a bad word because no country can default, uh, if, if Greece would step out of the euro, it may have a, uh, uh, an avalanche effect. Other countries may follow the same thing. If that happens, the euro is seriously in danger, not to say uh, at the point of collapsing. And who is suffering more from, the, from, from an euro collapse? It will be Germany. Germany has the most interest in preserving the euro because of its exports capacity and of its dealing throughout the, the European Union being by far number one. So it is not in the interest of Germany that the euro collapses. So they want to keep everything possible to extend and extend the, the, the status quo until they finally come to a conclusion. I would say, if this is the case, this is speculation, I know, but if this were the case, it's somehow my gut feeling that I have, but if this is the case, this would eff effectively give uh, Greece the opportunity to do what they have not done talk about and, and discuss a, pli a plan B until uh, next of October. And that should be a real uh, opportunity for Greece to then decide on how to negotiate their way out of the Euro. And I would add to that, and then I stop, I would add to that, it is not a tragic, it would not be as tragic as it appears, because there are ways for Greece to recover after the Euro. Fa in effect, the euro has not been in existence for more than 15 years, and we are enslaved to the banks uh, because of the euro, because we think we can, we, we have forgotten that before the world existed, be, be before the euro, with local currencies. That could be reinstated with a different banking system, with a banking system based on state bank or public banking, where the state bank or the public bank issues credits and bonds to, to the industry, to the, to the sectors that need the money to, to uh, regain the energy that is necessary to, uh, to, to revamp Greece's economy. So there are possibilities. It may be a slump for one or two years perhaps or less until the economy picks up when the banks have been reformulated into public or state banks that actually work not for Wall Street, not for the European Central Bank, but work for Greece and the Greek economy. So this is certainly a, a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I hope that the Greek government, I hope and I imagine that the Greek government is negotiating better than having them give us the money to pay them back what we owe and at the same time continuing with destructive measures uh, for Greece. George Alexakis from reporter.gr for Samir Amin or any other participant. In September, the elections in Spain, uh, do we needed to analyze this or uh, consider this as a turning point uh, for the developments in European politics? Yes, 
Yes, I, I think uh, it's same. The, oh, maybe you can come here. Oh, okay. I, I, I think that uh, after the, along with the example of uh, uh, the audacity of the Greek people with uh, Syriza, there is the audacity of the uh, Spanish people with uh, Podemos. Well, I don't want to go into an analysis which was presented yesterday, very beautiful. Oh, no, not at your meeting, at the other meeting. I, I attended too, the Renaissance uh, Resistance meeting also. Um, but not going into the details. Precisely, uh, what is happening is what Europe, what official Europe wants to stop at any price. Because uh, a success, or even a semi-success, of any one of the two uh, would uh, create, uh, as has been said, an avalanche. Uh, that would mean encouraging the people who are the victims of that system elsewhere, including in Britain, France, and Germany, um, uh, to also have the audacity to uh, uh, move out of the uh, neoliberal uh, recipes. That <coughs> is, is uh, so this is why uh, I'm saying it's not too late, too late even if Greece surrender today, because there is the October um, uh, elections and so on, and we, uh, you can uh, prepare uh, a new strategy uh, for uh, the future. Thank you. Boris Kagalitsky. Uh, just before going to Greece, uh, we had uh, another conference in Russia in uh, the city of Ufa, where we also had a representative of uh, Podemos, uh, um, Ivan Ayala, who is one of the people uh, who are designing the economic program of Podemos for the upcoming elections. And among other things, uh, we discussed Greek situation, and he reported that Podemos leadership is uh, examining what's happening in Greece very seriously, and so they're trying to learn from the Greek experience. Among other things, uh, they try to learn not to repeat the mistakes which are already made in Greece. Because let me be a little bit uh, harsh, maybe somebody will not like it, but I think that what is needed uh, here in Greece is courage. And of course the European left praises Syriza, uh, and we keep saying that Syriza is doing great work, but on, uh, honestly, I think that uh, the work can and should be done much better. Uh, because it's not only that the plan B was lacking, which is uh, something which should have been developed absolutely even before the elections, not to speak about developing it right after the elections and right after being uh, elected into power, but it seems that uh, the plan B is not yet available and it means that uh, Greece is going to face uh, a real problem when inevitable things are going to happen and Grexit in the long run and maybe even in the short run is an inevitable thing. So instead of trying to avoid it as if it is something catastrophic, one should develop a program dealing with the necessity to work and live and develop after that inevitable um, event, after that inevitable change. And then, instead of just saying we want to stay uh, within the Eurozone at whatever at 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 price, one should say, how should we properly live outside of the Eurozone? How should we exit? How should we transfer uh, our uh, resources to a different uh, type of development? And here, one doesn't only need a plan B. What one also needs is courage and determination and intelligence. And here, you also have to say that what is now considered to be a Greek crisis is a crisis of the Euro project as such. It is, a uh, it is a crisis of the European Union for which Greeks pay the price. And the policy of keeping Greece inside the Eurozone is a policy of making Greece pay for the errors 
made by the whole union and um, to pay for the uh, new liberal policies which were uh, actually designed to exploit the people of Europe. So you have to be very courageous, but you have also to be very clear on that. And finally, one needs to have some kind of plan B+, plus, which is what to do next. And here uh, you come to a point that you have to study the experience of other countries. And look, most countries which had default in similar circumstances did extremely well after the default. Look at Argentina under Nestor Kirchner. It is definitely a success story. Why? Because they unpacked uh, Argentina and Pesa from the dollar, which was exactly the same situation which we're facing now, and Argentinian industry started developing. They relaunched their production. They relaunched their domestic market. They relaunched tourism. They relaunched quite a lot of sectors. And look at Russia. Russia had its default in 1998. By then, Russia was in a very bad shape. And uh, whatever you can say about Russia now, it is definitely in a much better shape than it was in the 90s. You can say it's because of the oil prices. Yes, partly so. But also because uh, Russia passed through the default and Russia relaunched its industry and relaunched its production. So in that sense, we have to be very clear. You have uh, to go through that. Maybe it's going to be messy, but it also depends on how much effort is put into preparing the, 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 the process. Thank you. The situation in, uh, in Spain is uh, much uh, more complicated since there are autonomous regions. And uh, what is for sure that uh, those uh, political forces being not two main f forces, uh, Popular Party and Socialist Party, will uh, do very well on the elections, but it, it is not for them only. Be aware, because in Catalonia, for example, this I'm my partner parties. I'm uh, uh, in the group I told of regionalists. We have Escara Cartazuna de Catalonia, which which is first by right now in uh, in uh, Spain. There is Basque Country, there is Galicia, there is Valencia, and they will support their own left wing parties. Uh, uh, looking for m more autonomy for the regions. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um. Thank you, Tatiana. With Mr. Gardamiski and other friends before, you had the chance uh, uh, to take a taste of the discussions that were held during our conference. Well, I should say that s uh, several views uh, were expressed, uh, many different views both uh, about Syriza and uh, the tactics uh, that Greece uh, should follow. Uh, but what has really been evidenced is that uh, the Greek issue is vital and is of interest uh, to many other people, even outside Greece. And uh, the result, uh, uh, the Greek result, uh, will have effects and consequences for the whole of Europe and even further. Uh, let me make a brief remark. Uh, no matter whether we are talking about Plan A or Plan B, uh, and uh, no matter whether we are opting for one or the other uh, strategy, uh, what we need to realize, because we are uh, going to the war, we are in war, the others are just giving us their view. And uh, uh, we must be aware that when you are in war, uh, economic war, not a military war, you must act as if in war. The Greek political elite uh, from uh, the far uh, left uh, to the far right is not responding uh, to the situation of a country that is under threat uh, and where the survival is under threat. Only if uh, uh, we uh, treat the issue seriously as if uh, we were in war and as, uh, as if we were attacked by a foreign power, we cannot uh, resolve the problems and the crisis will go on no matter what tactics uh, we will follow. Followers of plan A and plan uh, B uh, systemically, regularly tended to underestimate the importance and the severity of the problem and they do not even allow people who have different views to express it because they do not like others uh, point out the problem. 
However, there is an issue. The Greek people must support it and the leadership must get rid of illusions that we can live again what we had between 1974 and 2010. We cannot go back to those times. Greece is faced with a serious survival problem and must respond with the seriousness and the courage and determination. I would not like us to turn this uh, press conference into a discussion. No, no way. But uh, given what Mr. Konstantakopoulos has just said, and uh, given that it is uh, true we are in war conditions, it's an economic war actually against the Greece uh, via the tactics of uh, imposing, enforcing a debt colony a status which has been enforced by our so-called partners, but there is also a real war which is uh, uh, taking place in our neighborhood. And this real uh, war is not, uh, uh, is not uh, properly uh, presented uh, uh, by our mass media. And it's not a coincidence. I'm talking about Donbass and the genocide there, uh, Eastern Ukraine. It is a war that uh, had been launched uh, by a government uh, which uh, came in power uh, by a coup d'etat with uh, the kind sponsorship and uh, full economic and military support of the US, the European Union, and NATO. So I consider that it is an opportunity now, because uh, uh, with uh, this course of the negotiations uh, recently, uh, it's about time to call things their name, because uh, the same centers which are trying to turn Greece into a dead colony and are creating uh, uh, demographic uh, disaster conditions uh, with their policies in Greece, the same centers are conducting a genocide war against the, the people of Donbass. The victims, according to some estimates of the British uh, secret services, in February were uh, above 50,000, and I think that it is only an under uh, calculation. There are journalists here, so uh, please go into this, look into this matter, and uh, uh, make your investigation to see what is going on in Donbass, and you will realize that this is a pilot plan. This is a pilot plan which our partners uh, are uh, concealing now and are hiding it be behind uh, uh, this war. Thank you, Dimitris. Let me add that in May 2010, uh, Greece uh, went bankrupt or defaulted. So it's not going to default now. The real stake is whether it will be able to handle its uh, default uh, via the program imposed by the European Commission, IMF, uh, ECB, and so on. Uh, leading to the greatest economic and social disaster in uh, Europe after the Second World War, or whether it's going to change its uh, course uh, by uh, defaulting officially, that is, uh, uh, stopping its payments. Anyway, I think this is the end of this press conference. I don't know if there is a burning question, otherwise I think we should stop. Okay, thank you very much for your presence. I hope we meet each other again. And I hope that next time we have more pleasant things to tell you. Well, we are making efforts for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming, although the day is very difficult. Uh, well, uh, one thing I forgot, and uh, that was my omission. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Vasos Lissaridis and uh, the Minister Nikos Ksidakis for their support in this conference. Thank you.